Good morning and welcome to our church school lesson for October the 18th, 2020. I am Latrenda Easton and I'm the church school superintendent here at St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church here in Sacramento, California, where the Reverend Philip R. Cousin Jr. is our pastor. Today we continue in our quarter theme for this quarter is love for one another. And we are in unit two of the quarter called inclusive love. And the focus of these four lessons on inclusive love is love for the stranger, the poor, the enemies, as well as divine love reflected in human life. We use the Precepts for Living Study Guide as our curriculum. If you have your study guide with you, we will be on, let's see here. We're going to be on page 79, Bible Study Guide 7 for October the 18th, Loving Your Neighbor. If you don't have a study guide, go grab your Bibles and follow along. Our lesson today is loving your neighbor and we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. Now your Bible background reading was Luke chapter Leviticus chapter 18 verses 18 and 34 and then Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. Our lesson aimed for today is to explore the concept of neighbor in the conversations between Jesus and the lawyer value all people as God does, and share love and mercy with those who are in need, even those who are different from us. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we just give you all the honor and we give you all the glory and all the praise for your word today and for your lesson today on loving your neighbors. Lord God, we just pray that your word here would be magnified today and that you would be glorified. Lord God, just open our eyes, open our ears, our hearts to the truth of your word in our lesson for today. This we ask in your name. Amen. Now, you know, we live in a multicultural society, a multicultural world, a multicultural country. And multiculturalism has evolved into cultural diversity. Now, each culture has and it keeps its distinctive characteristics and while it's possible and we do celebrate these distinctions it's these same distinctions that can also cause division now as christians we need to embrace a fundamental different way of responding to cultural differences a response that is grounded in the biblical story of the good samaritan now we are exhorted to love god and to love our neighbors. And this lesson reveals today the connection between the two and encourages us to expand our definition of neighbor. Now, do you have more trouble giving help to or accepting help from a stranger? Our lesson today is from Luke chapter 10 and Luke uh, was a physician. He was also a travel companion of the Apostles Paul and we know that from Colossians chapter 4. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and he also wrote its sequel, the book of Acts. Now Luke's audience consisted primarily of the Gentile Christians and Luke himself was also probably a Gentile. Now we are going to be in chapter 10. And beginning in Luke chapter 4 and 5, Jesus begins his public ministry in Galilee. And during his public ministry, he cast out demons, he preached, he healed, he performed miracles, he called his disciples, he appointed the 12 apostles. And there was a lot of dialogue with the Pharisees who were teachers of the religious law. And these Pharisees opposed Jesus and his teachings. So we are in Luke chapter 10, and that is we're continuing looking at these events that are occurring today were events during Jesus' public ministry. So our lesson today is broken into three sections. The first section is the test, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29, and then the parable 
in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. And then the moral, Luke chapter 10, verses 36 and 37. So our study guide has both the New Living Translation and the King James Version parallel. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. So grab your Bibles or you can follow along in your study guide. The first section, the test, and I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his action, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, you know, many times these teachers of the law, along with the scribes and the Pharisees, they questioned Jesus in order to try and trap him and to also test him. Now, they were trying to do this to discredit Jesus's ministry. Now, they were considered authorities in both religious and the moral law, and these um, expert in religious law, they were highly revered among the Jewish community. Now, they were proclaimed protectors of the law. They were also known as, depending on what version you're looking at, they were also known as lawyers and scribes. And they often questioned Jesus specifically on religious matters. Now, lawyers, being scholars of the Old Testament law, saw Jesus as a threat to the rules and regulations of Judaism. So this particular teacher of the law wanted to trap Jesus. So this religious scholar, he stands up with a question to test Jesus. And he says, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Now, these questions were usually popular questions of that particular day and time or they were ones in, in, in whatever answer was given would kind of place you in a particular theological camp. Now, to this expert in the Old Testament religious law, who also lived under the Old Testament law and who walked in the Old Testament law, Jesus answers according to the law. And he says, what is written in God's law? How do you interpret it? So in response, the lawyer basically quotes Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, verse 18, from the Old Testament law. And he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if his aim was to trap Jesus, he failed. The living word caused him to basically go to the written scriptures to explain himself. And Jesus says, good answer, do this and you will live. Now Jesus recognizes that the lawyer knows the law theoretically, but not experientially. So Jesus tells him he answered correctly. Now Jesus here is not implying that eternal life is based on works because the Bible tells us it is by faith alone in Christ alone. And in John 15 and in verse John 4, it tells us that one who loves God with all his heart his soul, his strength, his mind, is one who desires to please God through obedience. Now, while the lawyer's response was the correct verbal response, he tries to put Jesus on the spot with his next question in verse 29. And so looking for a loophole, the lawyer asks, and just how would you define neighbor? He says to Jesus. Now, let's move on to our second section, the parable in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. 
Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So here in verse 30, Jesus answers the question from verse 29, who is my neighbor, by telling a parable or a story as an illustration of neighborly love. Now, he says a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now, 20 miles long and dropping about 3,600 feet in elevation, the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho was commonly known as the Path of Blood because of the huge number of thieves and robbers who basically lie in wait to either ambush, ambush or attack unsuspecting travelers on that road. Now, on the way from Jerusalem to Jericho, the Jewish man was attacked by thieves and robbers. They take his clothes, they beat him up, and they leave him for dead on the side of the road. Now, many people during that time did not have a lot of extra clothes. So in those days, clothing was a pretty much hot commodity and a really valuable item to steal. Now, in 31, coincidentally, a priest was on his way down the same road a, a Jewish priest was on his way down the same road and he sees this man lying there half dead and he angles across to the other side. Now the priests in those days were kind of the politicians of the day and um, they basically called the shots and control the people in the communities. Now whatever his reasons for passing the man, his heart was far from the heart, was as far from the heart of God as it could be. And then in 32 it says a temple assistant who was a Levite, um, a Jewish Levite walks over and he too sees the man lying there half dead and he too angles across to the other side avoiding the injured man. Now a person would expect, right, we would expect the Jewish priest or the Levite to aid the injured fellow Jewish man but neither the priest nor the Levite help the injured man at all. And then in 33, then a Samaritan traveling down the road sees the injured man and his heart goes out to him with compassion. Now the Samaritans were in, enemies of the Jewish people and there was a deep-seated hatred that existed between the Samaritans and the Jewish people for like hundreds of years. And in New Testament times, the Samaritans were con basically considered heretics and were very hostile towards the Jewish people. And the Samaritans were despised, they were hated by the Jewish people because of their mixed Jewish Gentile blood and their different worship practices. And the relationship between these two cultures and these two groups of people was an extremely hostile one. And although there was this deep-seated hatred between the two groups of people and they were considered enemies, this Samaritan had compassion on the Jewish man. Now in 34, the Samaritan goes over to the injured Jewish man and administers first aid. He disinfects his wounds with olive oil and wine and then he bandages the man up. And then he lifts the man onto his own donkey and takes him to an inn to take care of him. And then in 35, the next day, the Samaritan gives the innkeeper two silver coins to take care of the injured Jewish man. And the Samaritan tells the innkeeper, you know what, if it costs more, put it on my bill and I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now in those days, two silver coins was a significant amount of money. Matter of fact, the innkeeper could use those two silver coins to basically remodel his entire inn. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a person would expect the priest, the Jewish priest or the Levite to help their injured fellow Jewish person, but neither the priest nor the Levite helped this injured man. And the Samaritan, however, I mean, goes out of his way to help the Jewish man who's considered his enemy. And unexpectedly, the Samaritan sets aside the cultural animosity and shows compassion. And even though in those days a Jewish person would admit it, 
the Samaritans knew just as well as the Jewish people did that God loved to show mercy. They both knew that, even though the Jewish community in that time probably would not admit it. Now, this Samaritan is a picture of love to someone with whom he is neither familiar with nor has any previous friendship with. But he was moved with compassion at seeing another person's misery. And it is undeniable that the Samaritan is the better person, the true neighbor. And he illustrates that a neighbor is one who sees another one who is in need and uses whatever resources he has to meet that need. So, can you recognize the hated Samaritan as your neighbor? Now moving on to our last section, the moral, in Luke 10, verses 36 and 37, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. In 36, he says, what do you think? Which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? And in 37, the lawyer responds, well, the one who treated him kindly, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus says, go and do the same. Now, the thieves and the robbers saw the traveler as easy prey to attack. The priest and the Levite saw the traveler as a, basically a nuisance to avoid. But the Samaritan saw the traveler as a neighbor to love. How do you see people? You know, this story challenges us, it blesses us, and it convicts us all at the same time. The Samaritan clearly acted, went above and beyond the norm to do all he could do to show love and concern for the injured man. And when the lawyer answers with the one who showed him mercy, he's realizing and admitting that the definition of neighbor is way larger than he assumed it to be when he asked the original question. And Jesus tells this religious scholar that he must do the same as the Samaritan did if he really wanted to inherit eternal life and fulfill the law. And Jesus uses this story of the Good Samaritan to reveal the lawyer's flawed and defective heart. Now, the command to go and do likewise, that is to show mercy to others, is, is not an entrance requirement for eternal life. But rather, it's really a call to follow Jesus' way of loving God and loving others from the heart. It's simply a life mindful of the way that we have been loved by God instead of living out self-justification. So how do you look upon anyone who is not a part of your group or your inner circle? You know, do you look at them as an outsider? God commands us to be neighborly to everyone. It doesn't matter the person's societal class, their culture, their, their political affiliation, their religion, their gender, gender, their race. Everyone is called to enter a relationship with Jesus. Those are all your neighbors. Our circle must be wide enough to encompass all of God's creation. So what message do you personally take from the Samaritan's willingness to stop and help the injured, injured Jewish man? What personal message do you take away from that? You know, in our liberating lesson, it says, you know, you know we live in a culture we live in a society where we are quick to excuse ourselves from helping others by thinking, you know, we think I don't need to get involved or we think I don't know how to help or I don't even speak their language or they're strangers. But the truth is that scripture doesn't let us off that easily. You know, sometimes we don't stop to help others because maybe we think they'll harm us or we're afraid that stopping may do more harm than good or we suspect the other persons of being involved in some type of illicit behavior. And you know, sometimes all of those things are true. But how do you discern when to help a fellow neighbor? You know, we look at race, we look at location, we look at appearance of that person before we determine whether we should help someone or not, or even love someone or not. And we look at all these things but God examines our hearts first. He examines the heart first. 
God stops and listens to our cries of distress, no matter what condition we're in, and God always comes to our rescue. So the next time you pass someone who's begging or stopped on the side of the road, put yourself in their place. Wouldn't you want someone to stop and help you? You know, in 1 John 14, it says, we know how much God loves and we have to put our trust in his love. God is love and lives in us if you are a believer. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. We love others because God loved us first. And if we say, it says right here in 1 John 14, if we say, I love God, but I hate my neighbor, I hate my fellow believer, we're called liars. The Bible says we're liars. Because it says if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we can't see? God commands those who love God, they must love their neighbors. They must love their fellow believers. So when God lives in you, those you serve should never find a reason to question whether your love is authentic. And you may recognize that statement. It came from our Christian Education Daily Spiritual Vitamin this week. So what, is it, what was at stake then in those times and what is at stake now is this question. Will you use the God-given revelation of love and grace as a way of boosting your own sense of isolated security like the Levite and the priest? Or will you see it as a call and a challenge to extend that love and grace, God's love and grace to the whole world like the Samaritan? You know, no church, no Christian can remain content with most of the world lying half dead in the road. So in our application for activation, it just says, consider the cries for help and the cries for mercy the cries for God's grace within your own world, your own circle. Can you help and will you help? And you know, the question is not who is our neighbor, but rather how am I a neighbor to others? Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for loving us so much that you gave your one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Cause us to value all people as you do. Help us to share your love and mercy with those who are different from us and those who are in need. This we ask in your name. Amen. So come back at, tune in at 1015 to get your worship and your praise on with victory. And then come back at 1030, tune in for worship and Pastor Cousin's words of medica meditation. Next week, our lesson title is Love Divine, and we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So your background reading, read your um, study guide. Um, you can also read the background reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through Corinthians chapter 14. So I cannot wait to see you guys next week. Be blessed. Have a blessed week, and I will see you all next week.